there was suddenly an explosion. It was from the center of the base, and you could feel the ground shake like an earthquake. And it was a kaboom, and I looked at the center of the base, and there was a column of fire rising, and the, all the lights on our perimeter went out. <coughs> Saboteurs had blown up our power station, and all the lights went out on this perimeter. Now we knew, okay, the communist terrorists are the other side, and oh my God, we can't see. In the towers, we had this new thing called starlight pistols. Now they say it's night vision, but this was the early days, and they were scanning the perimeter and saying, okay, we see people massing here, massing there, that sort of thing. Well, that's fine for you, but I'm sitting down, or standing down on the ground with my dog. And I'm between the tower and the concertina, the wire fence. And I've got nothing but darkness out there. So they start launching from the mortar pits uh, players. They only stayed up there for a little while, a few minutes, and then they come down. But we had, at our workstations, the center of our patrol areas, boxes of something called slap flares. Now, slap flare is a silver tube about as big around as this microphone. And it's about 12 inches long. And you take the cap off one end, and that cap you then thread on the other end. And when you're ready, you hold it at 60 degrees, slap the thing, which is where it gets the name from, slap the bottom, and it launches a Roman candle. Now this is a white phosphorus fireball. So I took out my slap layer. They said there was somebody, there was a bunch of people gathering in my quadrant, right the other side of the wire for me, and I wanted to see it. Well, I took it out, put the cap on the other end, held it at 60 degrees, and as I slapped it, I choked. Okay, and I leaned over. Oh, no. And that puppy went out nose high. Right across the wire, shoulder high, and all I saw in the light was buttholes and elbows and people <laughs> scattering. I said, hey, this is cool. I like this. Everybody, I can't. Now, the law said, these are the laws or the rules that our politicians imposed on us. They said that we could not discharge a round that would impact beyond our perimeter. So even though the towers were seeing the communists gather outside our wire, we couldn't shoot, but they could shoot at us, and they did. But here I said, flare right in the middle of them, and they scrambled out of the way. Hey, I didn't break any laws. I literally sent a flare up. Well, I got on the radio and said what I'd had, what I'd done. And everybody around the perimeter started launching their flares. Shoulder high across the perimeter. They never did come across the wire that night. Of course, we used up almost all of our slap players that night, too. <laughs> We had to get an emergency resupply the next day, but what the hey? When the war was over and everything else, it was time to head out. We, all of our people had gone ahead and been evacuated. Airplanes had taken them out. And the last few were still on base. I won the lottery with the cops. We had a lottery as to who would get the honor of putting the padlock on the gate. And I won. So I went down to the front gate and I put the padlock on the gate. And my Thai counterpart loaded me into his Jeep, drove me to the flight line, and I got on the airplane. It was the last airplane out. I caught off. There were no seats. It was crammed full. So I just plumped out on the floor and said, hey, I don't care, I'm leaving. Yeah. 
Uh, that plane was kind of full, wasn't it, Steve? Yes, it was. Steve was on the same plane here. So, kind of giving me my seat. Steve, thank you for your service. But that being said, now with those sorts of things that have gone on, and I came back to the States after that, people have been asking me, what is the most terrifying thing that have you know, I'll take them in order. Most terrifying and the most embarrassing. The most terrifying happened before I went in the military. Okay, during the time that I was bouncing all over trying, trying to be a folk singer. I tried to be on stage at Summerstock. I even landed a part of the lead, Mikey the Magic Dragon. Oh boy, that was rough on the knees, bouncing around on stage. But be that as it may. I also decided I wanted to learn how to fly. So I went to a place, Monroe, Connecticut, a nice sod field. It had an old airplane, fabric colored, covered wings, J3 Piper Cub. Honest to God, you had to pull the prop to start it. There was no automatic starter. They came, and I actually qualified to do a cross country my first cross country. I took off out of there. Now this is the most terrifying thing that I've ever done, okay? So remember that, it's coming. <laughs> I took off, climbed to altitude, turned toward Bridgeport. I could see Bridgeport Harbor in the distance. And I took out my air chart. I was supposed to fly to Keene, New Hampshire. I had my airway chart in front of me. I couldn't understand that thing. No. But do you remember the days of the paper road maps? Okay. Well, I had an SO road atlas. Okay. And I opened that for Connecticut, Bridgeport, that area. And, oh, okay. I can see that. And I found the Connecticut Turnpike, and yes, that's just the way it looks. So I'm going to follow that. And I went north of following the Connecticut Turnpike, buzzing along, finding my own, you know, you know, you know trouble is over New London, Connecticut. They were doing construction. I couldn't tell where the exits were, which exit was which, and I knew I was going to have to turn toward New Hampshire. So, lowered my altitude. In fact, I lowered my altitude enough that I could read the exit. <laughs> yep, I could read the exit sign. Okay, yeah, okay, now I see where I am, and I climbed back up to altitude. Made my way all the way to Keene, New Hampshire, landed, refueled, got my log side, I did it. Took off. No problems flying back. Yep, there's the Connecticut Turnpike again. <laughs> Followed that down to Bridgeport, turned up west up toward uh, Trumbull, and then, oh God, Monroe, my home airfield. I got there and I radioed in that we didn't have a tower. It was a little office that served like a tower, and I radioed in. And they said, okay, I'm cleared to land, so I entered the pattern. And when I actually rolled to a stop on this side field, I then went over, parked the plane, put the chocks under the wheels to keep it from rolling away, and they said, report to the office. I figured they were going to celebrate the completion of my first cross-country flight. Maybe they'd have a little cupcake with a candle in it, you know, that sort of thing. I went in, no, standing there next to my instructor who also owned the airfield was the biggest, tallest, broadest Connecticut State Trooper I have ever seen. He was massive. And I was looking at him and he said, are you Freeman? Yes, sir. Were you flying tail number November, blah, 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 blah. Yes, sir. 
Were you flying over New London, Connecticut this morning? Yes, sir. <laughs> he took out his little pad and wrote me a ticket. <laughs> okay, they had this new thing called the handheld radar gun. And he had one of those puppies. He got me doing, and he wrote me a ticket for it, 71 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour construction <laughs> car. Now that was the scariest thing because I figured my future is done. I'll never get to fly again, okay. And all these trees were out the window. So that was the scariest moment of my life. But with that being said, it's also the most embarrassing. Most embarrassing, scroll forward to when I told you about Thailand. There I was in Thailand, and we were in hooches, which had open slat sidings, no air conditioner, and as the airplanes were taken out, the helicopters taken out, the pilots' uh, facilities, they were living in trailers, three-room trailers and they became available. Now the pilots had air conditioning, and I put my name on the waiting list, and my name came up, and I was assigned to one of these, and there was a bedroom on each end and a Jack and Jill bathroom in the middle. But they had an air conditioner. I would come in after patrolling, flop down, I didn't care what I was wearing or I wasn't wearing. It was cool. Okay, one morning I got up. My trailer mate, she had already left for duty. I got up and then, remember these trailers have been in country in a jungle environment for over 10 years. They have plywood floors those floors gradually rot. So as you're walking along, it's spongy and squishy. I don't care, it has an air conditioner. That's all I care about. So I went in, washed my face, splashed my face with cold water, dropped my trousers, sat down on the commode, and was proceeding to make my contribution to Mother Nature. <laughs> when the floor gave way. <laughs> These trailers were built up on cinder blocks, okay? Now when the floor gave way, the toilet went through the floor, <laughs> a hole big enough for the toilet. And my mom, and down it went. But 